I've been asked lots of times, you know, why do I write about Detroit right away, write about Michigan? The flip answer is I don't live near San Francisco. <laughs> uh, but when I began writing books, uh, there's not been that much done with the Detroit setting, and not much done with a mystery or crime setting, and uh, that was surprising because we all know the history of Detroit, and its history, for better or worse, has been one of, of violence, sporadic violence uh, in and out. Sometimes sanctioned violence, it, it probably did more to win World War II. Uh, than any other single city through its, uh, through its industry, uh, but also through, uh, through the violent periods that we've known of, the times of Prohibition, times of uh, uh, the murder city years in the, uh, in the 70s, and uh, two major race riots in the 40s and the, uh, and the 60s. Um, but it has always been a city that's had this uh, hard-boiled, blue-collar, um, gritty background, a perfect background, I thought, for a hard-boiled type mystery, which is why I thought it was surprising that nobody had said classic private eye uh, story against uh, the background of uh, Detroit. That's why I chose that also because I know the city well. I knew the city well. I thought I did. I learned a lot more about it um, as I began researching that first book. And I actually probably learned more about it when I was promoting the book. because I found myself making more trips to and from Detroit in one year than I had my life foretold up to that point. Um, and, uh, and, and whenever I go there, I always see something new. It's a city that has many, many different facets, and all I have to do is, is kind of turn it and see what angle I haven't written about, and that'll give me kind of an in into the next either Amos Walker or standalone uh, story about uh, Detroit. So that's been good for me. I don't know so much about a, about a Michigan voice, um, although I insist on calling uh, soft drink pop. If you call it soda, there better be ice cream in it, you know, things like that. Uh, it definitely does have, you know, it's our own language. And it's one I like to play around with. And every once in a while, somebody in New York copy editor will ask, well, what do you mean by this? I'll even use a phrase like uh, a parking structure. Um, and they've never heard that phrase out east. They say, do you mean a parking garage? I say, well, yeah, if we want to make it so everybody understands. But I, I hadn't even thought about the fact that, uh, uh, that this language is, was that much different from what's, uh, what's spoken on the coast. So I'm always learning things like that. Uh, I just learned this week that the term freezing compartment is old to have. It's like people calling a uh, refrigerator an icebox. I hadn't known it was an old fart um, <laughs> until yesterday, until the other day I talked to my editor. I had some hints, uh, heavy ones for my wife, I might, I might say, certainly for my stepchildren and my grandchildren. Uh, but this is kind of the, the, uh, the confirmation. Um, but it's, it's just always been a good, rich place to write about for me. It's, it's uh, convenient because I can go to the places I write about um, and it's, uh, it's been rewarding because uh, it, it's a unique place to write about. And when I began writing, it hadn't been used that much for the setting. That got me a lot more attention than uh, just a brand, another new uh, uh, crime series might have gotten otherwise, because by this time, most of everybody in America had, had uh, uh, memorized all the streets of San Francisco and L.A. and New York, and this was like a new territory for them. So it's, uh, and that and the... Uh, uh, the support that I've had from local readers, as well as a lot of former Detroiters scattered across the world, I keep hearing from all the time, that through my books they kind of uh, uh, connect with Detroit and, and are reminded what the place is like, which may be why they haven't been back, I'm not sure. <laughs>
uh, the character of Ben Perkins, far more a real character because of that, he, because he, he wasn't just a different person between the short stories and the novels. I always found that very interesting and uh, admirable. Um, I've read, I've, I've experimented in first person myself, I mean in a, in a present tense myself, uh, never at novel length, but two of my favorite novels are written in present tense uh, by writers I admired. One was uh, Douglas C. Jones's The Court Martial of George Armstrong Custer, and another one was The Mouse That Roared, which was made with that wonderful Peter Sellers film about the, uh, the small country caught in medieval times that decides to declare war on the United States lose and, and pick up the benefits afterwards, <laughs> and they somehow win. Uh, but that story, it worked because it was in present tense, and just like you were right in the middle of that story. And when I've used it myself, it's nice because, as, as Teresa said, it, is, it does put you right in the moment. Uh, and it is true that, yeah, a lot of people, I grew up hearing people tell stories saying, so this guy comes to me and says, it's a very natural way to tell a story, and also when you use that, uh, uh, that device, it gets attention right away because it has not been overused and, uh, and it's, it's not used that often. Uh, and it will get your attention. And if it's done right, and, and it's, not always, it's not always right for the story you're doing or for the character you're doing, but when it is done right, very soon your audience uh, no longer notices that it's present tense. They are just very much into the story. So the, I guess the basic rule is there really are no rules. Uh, they're only there you know, to be broken, but first you have to learn why they're there before you do so. Uh, but I've, I, I have tended to use, I experiment a lot, I experiment a lot with point of view. Uh, that's very important. Uh, first person is a much more intimate way of telling a story, and also a much more natural way of telling a story. That's the way the cavemen told stories. That's the way our parents told stories. It was something that happened to them, so they would naturally make themselves the protagonist. It's a very natural way to go. Um, however, it doesn't let you get outside that character persona to see what's going on outside town. Uh, and that's when what I like to call shotgun perspective works very well. It's kind of semi omniscient uh, where you keep switching uh, uh, back and forth from one point of view to another, from chapter to chapter, from scene to scene. Uh, as a writer, maybe I'm, I'm tired of writing about this guy. Let's see what Jack's up to uh, on the west side of town. And I'll switch over there, and he might be in the middle of a gunfight or something like that, and then just keep switching back and forth. And that's, uh, that can be very exciting but uh, it has to work for the particular story. For me, with the Detroit series, which is a bunch of uh, books that take place in Detroit during different decades of the 20th century, as opposed to the Amos Walker series, I found that first person worked very well for Prohibition and Depression when the reporter is telling the story about Detroit during the 20s and 30s, um, because reporters very much got themselves into stories and sometimes made themselves the heroes of stories. It kind of worked to tell it from a first person point of view. Now, when I did another novel in that series set in Detroit in the 60s called Motown, uh, the shotgun perspective was much better. A different, a whole different points of view of a whole different bunch of characters and third person subjective. Um, because it was more psychedelic, like the 60s themselves were, just more frenetic time, and it just worked for that kind of a thing. And I have had books that didn't work well for me. I've been 30, 40, 50 pages into the book and it's not working and I realize I know what the problem is. I'm doing this for first person, I ought to try it from third or vice versa and I'll find often just flipping that switch will make a whole whole difference but I have to actually start the writing before I realize what is the right voice when I'm setting out to do an experimental piece of work like that. Now for the Amos Walker's first person has always worked for me because he's the guy telling the story. Um, of course you know with the series chances are unless the writer is getting tired of the character, and particularly if it's a first-person character, the guy's going to survive the book. Everybody knows that. You know, it's that willing suspension of disbelief. You know, you try to make them think maybe he won't get through it, even though he's telling us a story. Um, and I've seen people actually make that one work too. Uh, but one of the nice things when I do a standalone, like Gas City, which is a kind of a hard book story that takes place in a town I made up with a whole bunch of characters I made up, um, you're not sure who's going to survive that book, and not everybody does. Uh, and that gives you an extra little bit of edge of excitement that you wouldn't have normally with a series. And it's exciting to me, too, because I never know how a book's going to end. So I don't know if this character's going to survive or not. So it's a lot of fun for me. That's the difference, I think, between the two, uh, the two approaches. Uh, I think one of the good things about 